So I, I know that not all of you are philosophers, so I'll try to get by with as little uh, jargon as possible, but it will help to uh, you know, define some of the terms, and uh, I'll do that. <clears throat> and I think I should start with some general background on free will. So we have uh, two main schools of thought in the free will literature. There are people called compatibilists, and they contend that free will is compatible with determinism. And when people who aren't philosophers hear that, they sometimes think, well, how could anybody think that? Uh, and the people who think, how could anybody think that, probably <clears throat> are thinking of determinism as, oh, whatever it is that's incompatible with free will, whatever it is that rules out free will. But of course, uh, that's not how we think of uh, of uh, compatibilism in uh, philosophy, and it's not how we think of determinism. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any compatibilists. So, we understand determinism pretty much the way it's understood in physics, and the idea is that a universe is deterministic if a complete uh, description of the condition of the universe at any point in time, and a complete list of all the laws of nature, entails all other truths about the universe. Uh, so the idea there is, once the universe is up and running and the laws are in place, uh, there's only one way in which it can unfold. And compatibilists say, that's okay, that still leaves room for free will. Now why is that? Well, it's because they're thinking of something like the following as being sufficient, not necessary, but sufficient for free will. That the person is sane and rational, uh, well-informed, uncoerced, uncompelled, let's say, addiction-free, and so on, and uh, he makes a reasonable decision on the basis of good information. Such a person would be said to make a free decision by compatibilists. Now, some people hate compatibilism even after that, and, you know, that's okay. Uh, incompatibilists don't like compatibilism. They say determinism, as I explained determinism to you, uh, is incompatible with free will, and they want something else. Now, my own view, uh, ever since I got started, really, uh, writing on free will, and my first book on free will was published in 1995, my own position is to stay agnostic or non-committal or neutral about this dispute between compatibilists and incompatibilists, and then to develop two different positive pro-free will theories, one for compatibilists and one for the incompatibilists. So, instead of... Uh, Unlike most philosophers, anyway, I have two offerings <laughs> instead of just one, which I think is really cool, and some people think, oh, you're being too sneaky, but, but we'll see. Um, so I have these two different views. Now, so today, what I'm going to talk about is the pro-free will incompatibilist view, and as you can tell, I don't endorse the incompatibilist part of it, but I'm really interested in the, the positive theory that can be offered from the incompatibilist point of view. And um, the way I'm going to do it <coughs> is from an incompatibilist point of view that features event causation. And so what we're going to have then, instead of ordinary causation that is event causation and deterministic, is causation that's indeterministic so that the laws of nature that would govern it or be relevant to it would be probabilistic laws. So, so that's how we're thinking about it. So there's nothing fancy. Uh, it's a purely naturalistic kind of position, and uh, we're going to see uh, what I can do with it. Now, the way I lead into it in this talk is by looking at the only really well-developed event causal libertarian view in the literature. And this is uh, the view uh, advanced by a philosopher named Robert Kane. Kane's been at it for a long time, and I'll talk a bit about how his view evolved, um, and then we'll get to what I think are some problems with it, and an alternative that I floated um, in my 2006 book, Free Will and Luck. So I'm, I'm sort of going back 10 years, but for me it's fun because in the last several years I've mainly been working on neuroscience and free will, or various scientific arguments for the non-existence of free will, and it's nice to get back to pure theory. Um, 
Okay, so we're going to be focusing then on uh, free actions that are indeterministically caused by their proximal causes, by the causes right before them. That's where the, that's the land on which the, the talk appears. And um, there's a problem for any libertarian. Libertarians are incompatibilists who believe in free will. That is, incompatibilists who say at least some people sometimes act freely. And the problem is generated by a standard libertarian requirement uh, for a free action. In this talk I'll concentrate on decisions. Much of the free will literature really is about free choices or decisions. And the requirement they make on a free decision, say a person decides to do something A, is that there be another possible scenario where everything is the same right up until then. The entire past and all the laws of nature in which the person doesn't decide to do A. So the person might go on thinking for a while, uh, get distracted, but the alternative possibility that libertarians focus on is making the opposite decision, deciding not to A or deciding to do B instead of A. So the requirement is, look, your decision isn't freely made unless there's another possible scenario where everything's the same up until then, uh, in which you make a different decision. That's a normal requirement. Uh, we tend to talk about this in terms of possible worlds. Possible scenario is good enough for me, as long as we keep in mind that we're holding the entire history of the universe fixed across scenarios and all the laws of nature. Uh, some people like to think about it in terms of rolling back the universe. Sometimes they say rolling back time. So time rolls forward and John decides to, I don't know, steal my car, and he decides it at T. And then if that decision's going to be free, well, then if we could roll back time and then roll it forward uh, all the way up until T without making any changes in some other possible, well, in this rollback, he'll make a different decision. And that's required, that kind of thing is required by typical libertarian views uh, for free decision making. Now, some people will say, well, they uh, require it, so it can't be a problem. After all, your requirements can't be a problem. But sometimes your requirements are a problem. Sometimes you require uh, something that actually precludes the possibility of what you're trying to get. So, for example, there was a time at which some philosophers argued that determinism was required for free will. That if determinism were false, there couldn't be any free will. And if the incompatibilists are right, then this requirement these guys made would actually be inconsistent with free will. So there's a worry in that ballpark <coughs> about this libertarian requirement. And here's a way to illustrate it. Here's one way. Uh, there are other ways, and you might not like this model, and if you don't, we can talk about other models. But, so now we could think about, okay, well, how do we model this situation where, even though in the actual world at T, he decides to steal my car, in another possible scenario where everything's the same up until then, he makes a different decision. How do we model it? Well, here's one way to model it. What goes on when this happens is that a little neural roulette wheel in the head gets activated and it starts spinning around and it's indeterministic because we need indeterminism there. And a little indeterministic neural ball drops onto the wheel and bounces around. And the various segments of the wheel, different collections of segments, correspond to different outcomes. So a decision to steal my car, a decision not to steal my car, uh, continuing to think about things for a while or whatever. Uh, and so we get these antecedent probabilities of what's going to happen, and the ball's landing in a segment is the person's making the decision he makes, uh, deciding to steal my car, deciding not to steal it, or in, in the case of non-decisions, just continuing to think about things for a while. Now, oh, could I? Yeah, sure. Why, well, you want to see me? <laughs> okay. I am beautiful, you know, uh, so I can understand that request. Um, okay, so when you think about things that way, when you have that model in mind, you might think, oh my goodness, you know, this, this really is uh, a matter of luck. Um, 
could the person really be freely deciding? And you might look at the difference between two worlds, say a world in which he decides to steal my car and a world in which he decides not to steal my car at the very same time, everything being the same up until then, and you might think uh, in, in the world in which he decides to steal it, well, if this guy had been a bit luckier, he would have made the, the right decision. So can I really blame him? And so on. So this is a worry, and it's a worry that Cain uh, tries to solve. So I'll be talking about his attempted solution and then uh, my own way of thinking about it. Okay, now, what I want to do, just to give you some more background, it, it sort of helps to get all this into your heads, is um, tell you about how Cain's view <coughs> evolved. So his uh, first view, this was in a 1985 book, was this. Well, what happens is that um, a person is uncertain about what to do. We have indeterminism in the head all the way up until the moment of decision. And he tries to make the right decision. Uh, and either he's going to succeed in making it or he's going to fail. And either way, the decision is free. And then a guy named uh, Bruce Waller, who was Robin Waller's father-in-law, what a coincidence, um, came up with an objection to this, and, and it was essentially that objection I ran through, but without the roulette wheel and, and the theater, just a straightforward objection. Well, consider this guy then in um, another world where he makes the wrong decision. Isn't it just a matter of luck that he makes one rather than the other? And if it is, can we really blame him or give him credit when he makes the good one? And if we can't really blame him or give him credit, should we really see him as free? Uh, and then Cain's reply, and this was in his 1996 book, was, well, you know, these worlds are indeterministic, and there's also, they're also indeterminate. So that the effort that the person is making to make the right choice has no precise numerical value, you could put it that way, that you can assign to it. It's kind of fuzzy. Um, and so there won't be any other possible world or po uh, possible scenario that's exactly the same as this one because there's going to be fuzziness in anything you get. Um, and to me that looked like a sort of dodge, so then I published a paper in which, among other things, I said, well, let's pretend that Cain is right and you can't get exact sameness across worlds. Get them as close as you can so they're equally fuzzy at the same time. And uh, and even then, it looks like it's just a matter of luck. The difference, that is, between the worlds is just a matter of luck. Uh, Cain worried about that, too, so he revised his view. And then the, the new view, which came out for the first time in 1999, and he's sticking with it, although he's adding more stuff, but um, the new view is that when you're in a situation where free decision is a possibility, you actually make two different simultaneous efforts to choose things. You make an effort to choose to do the right thing, and you make an effort to choose to do the tempting thing, the other thing that you're attracted to. So you're simultaneously trying to make one decision while trying to make another decision. And then his claim is, so either way it goes, so suppose you um, make the right decision, you decide not to steal my car. Either way it goes, you succeeded in choosing what you were trying to choose, so it's a free choice. And if you had chosen the other way, well, you were trying to choose that too, so it's a free choice. Okay? Got it? So, two efforts to choose. Um, and a key claim in this connection, and this is from a, a recent paper by Cain, 2014, it's on the handout. The agent makes one set of reasons prevail over the other by making an effort to do so against the competing effort to make a contrary choice. So what you have going on is you're trying to choose to do one thing. You're trying to choose to do the opposite thing. And these uh, efforts to choose are directed not only at their targets, like choosing this, choosing that, but also at defeating the opposing effort. Got it? Okay. Um, I see somebody shaking his head. Yeah, you might think, wow, this is you know, really far out. Well, well, we'll just see. We'll see how it goes. Um, so now I, I launch into assessing Cain's view. I'll do a bit of that. Um, first of all, 
just a bit on this. There is a phenomenological worry about this picture. And the worry is this, or one way for you to think about it is, how often have you had the experience of trying to choose to do one thing while also trying to choose to do the opposite? And what you might think is, never. And it will depend on how you're understanding the trying and so on. And keep in mind that the trying he's talking about is directed not only at a goal, it is making a certain choice, but also at defeating uh, the other process that's aimed at its own goal, the opposite choice. So how often have you experienced that? Uh, and you might think, never. I have to say I never have. And I'm not even sure what it would be like to try to choose to A, although I, I do understand what it's like to try to bring it about that I make a certain choice. Now, the, the latter thing uh, I can explain to you in a, a kind of simple way. So imagine a, a person who's, you know, for years been thinking about quitting smoking. And maybe every New Year's Eve he, he thinks hard about it. And, um, and he's thinking about it again, and he tells his wife, let's say, you know, I really should quit. And then she says to him, well, I've heard you say that before. Have you decided to quit? Have you decided yet to quit? He says, no, not yet. You know, I, I wish I could make it over that hurdle. What I need to do is figure out a way to get myself to decide to quit. I've got to work on myself some, somehow and get that to happen. So that would be trying to bring it about that you make a certain choice. And Keynes talking about something more direct, although we could try to be like bend over backwards to be charitable and say he's talking about that. But then to get what he wants, this same guy would have to be trying to bring it about that he decides to quit, while also trying to bring it about that he decides to continue smoking, and he'd have to have these efforts directed at each other, <coughs> internal battling. So, okay. So that's one kind of worry. It's a phenomenological worry. I mean, I, I think maybe nobody ever experiences this. Um, and he could say, well, that's okay. You know, it happens anyway, even though nobody ever experiences it. And that's a possibility, but we'd sort of want to know how it happens, and then it would be happening unconsciously, so we'd want to know how all that works out, too, what these unconscious efforts are like. That's one worry. I'm not going to push it too far. Um, okay. Now, so just suppose for the sake of argument that people do make these concurrent competing efforts to choose. Suppose that's what goes on. Uh, so would that do it? would we then have a solution to the free will problem? Uh, I've got a lot of cases here. I'm going to try to streamline this a bit. But the cases sort of help to get into the frame of mind I'd like you to be in. So we'll do some. So there's a, a target shooting case. And imagine you're playing a game and you're ambidextrous and you get a prize for hitting a target. I know I sound like a typical American now. So here we are shooting at targets. But that's okay. <laughs> You get a prize for hitting a target, and what you know is that one of the targets or the other will actually disintegrate before anything hits it, and it's undetermined which one will. So what you do, you're ambidextrous, your strategy is, you want the prize, you fire at each target. Okay? Um, now, one of the targets will go out of existence, the other one will stay in existence. You're really good at shooting, so you'll shoot at least one. But it will be just a matter of luck that you hit this one rather than that one, because it's just a matter of luck which target stayed in existence and which one went out. So you've got these dual attempts, but it's just simple shootings aimed at different targets, and you have the indeterminism in there, too. Um, okay, it's sort of remote from Kane's case, but it's a way to start up. Now, one difference between that target case and Kane's cases is that in the target case, what you do is over once you pull the trigger, and then either the target will be hit or it'll disappear and it won't be hit. So it'd be nice to have a closer analogy where uh, the action lasts all the way up until the, the goal is hit or not hit. So you could do one with uh, sticky keys. So it's keys on a keyboard, and you get a prize uh, for pressing a key all the way down, but you know that the keyboard is uh, indeterministic and that it's going to happen, 
that uh, one of the keys sticks and doesn't make it all the way down. And to get the money, the key has to go all the way down, hit the switch under it, okay? Uh, and so your strategy here is, well, I'll press both, and uh, one of them will go down, and I'll, I'll win the prize. So there, the action lasts all the way through to the goals being achieved, and there, too, it's not up to you which of the keys goes all the way down. It's not up to you which one you press all the way down. The, that is partly a matter of luck. It depends on which one sticks and which one doesn't. Now, there we don't yet have the mutual interference part of Kane's picture. So to get that, we can go to sticky keys with strings and pulleys. So the idea here is you can tie your fingers together in such a way and have these pulleys rigged up so that uh, each attempt to press a key is going to interfere with the other attempt to press a key, right? I haven't built this device yet, but I can picture it. <laughs> um, and uh, so there we're going to satisfy the mutual interference condition, but still it looks like it's going to be just a matter of luck which key goes all the way down. Um, I want to do one more of my sticky keys cases, because I want to get reasons into it. Um, so this time we introduce uh, a brain scanner, and um, we tell the person that to win the prize, the person has to represent herself, I think it's Donna in this case, she has to represent herself as trying to do a certain thing for the reasons that favor it, and trying to do another thing for the reasons that favor it, and let's let the things be uh, donating five pounds to save the puppies, and donating five pounds to save the kittens, and if the key on this side goes all the way down, the five pounds goes to the puppies, if the key on this side goes all the way down, the five pounds goes to the kittens, and we have the strings and pulleys, and we have the brain scanner, to detect whether she's actually representing things in the right way, representing herself as getting these reasons to win out or those. So we do all that, and um, in the end, then, which set of reasons wins out is going to be just a matter of luck. That is, that this one wins out rather than that one, or that one rather than this one, because what's going to determine that, really, is which key gets stuck and which one doesn't. Okay? Uh, if this stuff is sounding too goofy, I apologize, but I just sort of like goofiness for its own sake, so uh, I do have this special attraction to it. But you get the point, right? So now we have this kind of physical model, sort of physical analog of the kind of process he's talking about. Um, okay, so now let's do my Bob and the Coin story. This, this is from uh, my book, Free Will and Luck, the 2006 book but we'll do it uh, with a cane style agent. So the story is this. Bob lives in a small town in the U.S. where people like to bet on all kinds of things. And they bet not only on who's going to win a football game, say the game that's about to happen, but also on what time the coin toss will occur, the toss that starts the game. And Bob has promised to toss the coin at noon, and a few minutes before noon, a notorious gambler, Carl, comes up to Bob and says, you know, I've put a lot of money on you tossing it at 12.02, two minutes after noon. So if you could just pretend to be fumbling for that coin in your pocket for a couple of minutes and then toss it, I'll give you 50 bucks. And Bob is now torn, and he's thinking, um, geez, you know, I should do what I promised to do, toss it at noon but I'll win 50 bucks if I pretend to be fumbling it uh, for it in my pocket and toss it at 12.02. And all the way up until noon, he's struggling this, with this question. And now we make him a cane style agent so that what he's trying to do is two different things. He's trying to choose to cheat, and he's trying to choose to do the right thing. Um, that goes on all the way up until noon. One of those efforts wins out in the actual world, uh, in another possible world or scenario where everything's the same up until then, the other effort wins out. So it looks like the difference between those two outcomes, again, is just a matter of luck, even though we have 
everything Keynes says he wants. We've got the dual efforts, each effort is made for reasons, and so on. Now, that the outcome is just a matter of luck might not be a serious problem. In fact, I hope it isn't. And I have a way of trying to soften the blow of the problem. But the point so far is that it's not so easy to see how Kane has softened the blow. Still looks pretty lucky. Um, all right. Yeah, I think that's. So now I'm on to point four on the handout. So how are we going to deal with the uh, problem of present luck? Now here's one plank in my response to the problem of present luck. It's LD on the handout. And LD reads as follows. Even if the difference between what an agent decides at T, where T is a particular time, in one possible world and what he decides at T in another possible world with the same past up to T and the same laws of nature is just a matter of luck, the agent may decide freely at T in both worlds. That's, that's a proposition I would like to think is true, and I might try to persuade you that it might be true if I have enough time uh, today. Um, so my question is, what's a plausible explanation of the truth of LD? And we've seen Kane's answer, and you know maybe you're not wild about it. Um, now, before we get to a kind of answer that I have developed elsewhere, I want to sort of take a step back now and move away from decisions to overt actions, actions that essentially involve bodily motion, and uh, a sort of companion principle to LD. It's LG on the handout. Even if the difference between what an agent does at T in one possible world and what he does at T in another possible world with the same past up to T and the same laws of nature is just a matter of luck, the agent may act freely at T in both worlds. Now, let's consider some cases. So imagine a sticky key with brain scanner case in which the task uh, for the agent is to uh, shock a kitten. So electrically shock a kitten. The Milgram experiment is the, uh, is the background for this one, except this is going to be real shocking and the, and the agent knows it, OK? Um, and if the key on this side goes all the way down, he shocks the lovely white kitten. And if the key on that side goes all the way down, he shocks the beautiful gray kitten. And uh, he gets $5 every time he shocks a kitten. Okay, so you, you tell the guy, this is the deal. He's got the strings and pulleys. We have the brain scanner. Um, and he goes for it. And this time, the uh, gray kitten key gets stuck and the other one doesn't, so uh, he shocks the white kitten. And next time he shocks the gray kitten, and so on. Okay, so that's the case. And it's just a matter of luck that he shocked the gray kitten rather than the white kitten when that happens, and vice versa when the other thing happens. But would you hold him morally responsible and believe that he is morally responsible for shocking the white kitten when he shocks the white kitten, or the gray one, uh, other things being equal. That is, he's not insane, uh, he's well-informed, he's greedy, you can tell, because he's doing it for five bucks, um, but he doesn't really, he's not poor, okay? And um, what you might say is, yeah, you know, I would blame this guy, and I would be right to blame him, he deserves to be blamed. And then your next thought might be, but if he deserves to be blamed, then he must have done it freely, because if he didn't do it freely, he wouldn't deserve any blame. It would be, you know, he'd have an excuse. He unfreely did it. So there you are thinking, um, if, you're, if you're following this line of thought and sort of like it, oh yeah, you know, he freely shocks that uh, gray kitten in this case, even though whether he shocked the gray one or the white one is just a matter of luck. So there can be cases where whether you do A or B, is just a matter of luck. That is, the difference between your doing A and your doing B is just a matter of luck. And still we say, he freely did it. He freely did what he did. Um, okay, so LG, I have more cases, but I'm not going to do them. Um, LG doesn't look so bad. I mean, this would be a case that confirms LG if you have these intuitions about this case, and you might not. I mean, people who think there's no free will no matter what, are going to say, no, he doesn't freely shock the kitten. 
or people who think that nobody ever deserves to be blamed from a moral point of view for anything would say, no, this guy doesn't deserve any blame. And there are maybe other more subtle moves people might consider. But on the face of it, this case looks like confirmation for LG. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. And I don't, when we get back to moral responsibility, although it does seem to me that he's morally responsible for shocking that beautiful gray kitten, you know, it's a horrible thing to do for five bucks, um, he's not morally responsible, I think, for the contrastive fact, that is the fact that he shocked the white one rather than the gray one. So he's responsible for what he did, but not for the contrastive fact. Okay. And why is that? Well, you know, it was just a matter of luck that he ended up shocking the white one rather than the gray one. All right. So now it's time, but I haven't told you what uh, my daring libertarian view is, but it's time to <laughs> compare the two views. And I'll start with a really thin uh, description of my daring libertarian view. So first of all, uh, why is it called daring? Well, way back in uh, 1995, when I did my first free will book, Autonomous Agents, I had this kind of modest, and I even called it modest, uh, view for libertarians. I also had my compatibilist view for compatibilists. For people who came in late, I am not an incompatibilist, nor have I ever been, nor will I ever be, I believe. Um, so back then I had a kind of modest proposal for libertarians. Uh, where you put the indeterminism a bit further back from the moment of decision. It's sort of an elaborate view, but it seemed less threatening back there for reasons I can explain if anybody's interested. But in uh, my book, Free Will and Luck, I moved the indeterminism all the way up to where typical libertarians want it, uh, right at the moment of decision. And so that move from uh, being moderate to moving it all the way up there was a daring move on my part, so daring libertarianism, okay? Uh, so that was the idea. So that's the daring part. And my libertarian view, well, there are two aspects of it. One is about what the agents are like, how they work internally, and then there's a sort of historical aspect too. But about how the agents work internally, it's a stripped down version of Keynes' view. So I don't have people simultaneously trying to choose to A and trying to choose the competing course of action. I do have indeterminism at the moment of <coughs> decision because that's what typical libertarians want. Okay, so that's enough on that for now and then we'll get to the, the historical part a little bit later. So here's Cain on something he calls plural voluntary control. This is a quotation. Uh, this is a quotation from his 2014 paper and it's on the handout. We are interested in whether agents could have acted voluntarily and intentionally in more than one way rather than in only one way and in other ways merely by accident or mistake. I call such conditions of more than one way voluntariness and intentionality plurality conditions for free will and the power to act in accordance with them plural voluntary control. So this plural voluntary control is, is very important to Cain for free will. And he actually thinks that when you have it, it's up to you what you do. And he says, uh, in that case, you do it freely as well. Now, regarding my daring libertarian view, Cain grants the following. This is a quotation on the handout. We can say that the choice that results is made by the agent, and we can even say it is voluntary since uncoerced, and intentional, since knowingly and purposefully made. And this is going to be true in both worlds of my agents, that is, whichever choice they make, this is going to be true of them, so that uh, my daring libertarian view would accommodate plural voluntary control over choice making, satisfies Keynes' condition. Now Keynes says, this is on the handout too, that plural voluntary control in this connection is sufficient for the choice the agent makes to be up to the agent. So if Cain is right about this, then my daring libertarian view also accommodates it sometimes being up to agents what they choose in scenarios of the sort at issue. So given Cain's own account of plural voluntary control and his own claim about what is sufficient for an agent's choice to be up to the agent, 
an agent who's making of a particular choice fits my daring libertarian view, makes a choice that it was up to him to make. So it looks like I'm there, right? I've satisfied all his conditions, uh, uh, I've done it. But no, then he says, this is in the 2014 paper, and this is a quotation, the agent will indeed make one choice or the other at T, this is my kind of agent, right? Uh, but which choice the agent makes depends on which reasons win out, and this is undetermined. That the agent decides to do A at T in one world and B in another seems therefore to be mat a matter of luck or chance. So end of quotation, and so he says, my agents don't act freely, even though they satisfy all those conditions he stated. So you wonder, uh, what's going on? Well, one thing to notice is that which reasons will win out is at no time determined on Keynes' view either, because remember, it's undetermined right up until the moment of choice or decision. Right up until the choice or decision is made, what choice or decision will be made, and given that that's undetermined that whole time, it's undetermined which reasons will win out, all the way up until it's settled because all it is for a reason to win out in these cases is that you make the choice that corresponds to them. It's not as though you make the reasons win out before you choose. Um, so it's undetermined on his view, too, so that can't be a reason to reject mine because it's a feature of both of our views. Um, and it's no less a matter of luck which of the dual efforts wins out than uh, what the guy chooses if he's a daring libertarian agent of mine. So it looks like Cain got to a certain point and then something kind of weird and mysterious is going on, um, but the reasons he gives for rejecting my view can't really be offered by him because they would uh, falsify his view too. Okay, now, um, I want to do a bit on relative costs and then we'll get to the historical part of my view, and I, I think I have time to do all that. On the handout it says if time, but I think I, I made time for it. So what I call present luck or cross-world luck, uh, luck at the moment of decision, is a feature of both views. He requires that it be undetermined all the way up to the moment of decision which of these processes wins out. Uh, so you can have one process win out in one world, one in another, everything being the same up until then. The difference between those worlds at that time will be a matter of luck. That's a feature of both of our views. Uh, he has an empirical burden that I don't have because he requires uh, for free decision making that the agent make these dual efforts to choose, dual competing efforts to choose. And as I said, I don't think that ever happens, but it's not as though my view takes a stand on that. It gets by without it. So he's got a requirement I don't have. Um, the other requirements are the same. So he's got a burden I don't have, an empirical burden. Um, okay, so it looks like I have all the advantages of his view without the disadvantage, and if that's right, then I win this little battle with Bob Kane, which would make me really happy, you know, I, I like to win these little battles. And then there are going to be all these other possible battles with people uh, who don't like event causation for free action, for example, or for people who don't like causation at all for free action. But this would be uh, one battle. Now, um, so I, I said I'd talk a little bit more about my daring libertarian view and uh, advantages of it. So what Kane does, like almost everybody who works on free will, is he zeroes in on the moment of decision, that, that last moment and tries to find something special there that's going to explain to us why that decision is free. So it's, you sort of look at a moment. Um, and my thought, even way back when, was maybe it's a mistake to zero in at, on that moment, and maybe what we should do is pay more attention to how agents came to be the way they are at the time at which they make the decision they make. And here is the idea. So I did that roulette wheel thing for you, and it's a sort of tricky little model, but one thing it might have encouraged some of you to do is just to suppose that the antecedent probabilities of outcomes that get represented on the roulette wheel 
are coming out of the blue. And then you might think, man, these probabilities are coming out of the blue, and then one of these things or another is going to happen. The agent isn't looking free. But what if the antecedent probabilities come out of a long history of behavior, including choice making, uh, reflection on the consequences of choices we made, so good choices, reflection on that, bad choices, reflection on that, uh, thinking about what to do in response to what we learned from our choices, trying to shape our character uh, in line with what we believe, um, and so on. If we think about agents like that, um, and if we're, you know, libertarians of a, of a normal kind, we're also going to think when agents make these decisions over time, these different decisions throughout their lives, whenever those decisions are free, there was some indeterminism at the moment of decision. Um, but you might think, oh, well, if that's how it goes for normal agents, then they have actually shaped the antecedent probabilities on the wheel, and so maybe they have uh, some responsibility for those probabilities and some responsibility for the decisions they make. And then if you assume, as a lot of people do, but it is something you can argue about, that um, a being who sometimes is morally responsible for some of what he or she does is a being who has free will, uh, then you get free will in there. Now, if you start thinking of things in this way, in this sort of historical way rather than a time slice way, of course you're going to ask yourself, well, you're going to be forced back in time in your thinking, and you're going to get to a point where you wonder, uh, Okay, so what about the first free choice, or the first choice for which an agent was morally responsible? What went on there? Now, if you think about it from a real-world point of view, you might start thinking about ages, and normal kids at ages. And, uh, for example, if I suggested to you, say I, I said I had neuroscientific evidence that the first free choice isn't made by human beings until they're 32, uh, what would you think? No way, you know, there's no way that could be true, right? Uh, or 18, and you might think, nah, no way, that's way too late. Um, at what age do normal parents start feeling like it's appropriate to blame their kids from a moral point of view for things they do, or give them some credit from a moral point of view for some of the things they do? And you might think it's around four or five, or you know, whatever it is you think. Um, suppose you, th you think it's around five, um, and you think, you know, that, well, we'll do a story and then we'll see what you might think. So here's a story. So there's a normal kid, he's, f he's around five or four, and he gets a kick out of pulling his sister's hair because he likes the screaming reaction. Um, and his parents have told him he shouldn't do it, and they try to explain why, and he's sort of getting a grip on it. Um, and then one day he's thinking about doing it again, and his father can tell. His father's hiding in another room but peeking around the corner, and he's thinking, boy, is he going to do it again? The kid's name is Tony. And he sees Tony reach, and then he sees Tony stop on his own and show a little look of pride on his little face, right? And uh, he thinks, good for Tony. Um, he did the right thing. He deserves a little credit. Now, you may disagree or you may agree, but uh, if he does deserve some credit, then the bar for moral responsibility for little kids like this isn't going to be all that high. You know, it's going to be relatively low. Now, kids that age have a big problem with impulse control. Four-year-olds have a lot less impulse control than eight-year-olds, for example. And they have a problem uh, looking at the consequences of their actions, projecting into the future and figuring out how things are going to go. Way worse than eight-year-olds on that, too. So Tony already has these two pretty serious problems, and then what I think really is, so you mix in a little indeterminism at the moment of decision. What kind of problem is that compared to serious impulse, impulse control problems and uh, projecting into the future problems? If we had the impulse control of four-year-olds, we would be in serious trouble, right? Um, and so what I try to do is, is make the indeterminism not look so scary, and I, I try at a point in an agent's history at which the bar for moral responsibility, if moral responsibility exists, is going to be pretty low, and I compare the indeterminism with these more serious problems. Now, one way to get a grip on that is you think, 
is I could ask you to think about this. There is no indeterminism at the moment of action, but impulse control problems are there in Tony, and uh, this projecting into the future ability that, that's not so developed in Tony. Might he ask, might he uh, be morally responsible for what he does? And if you think yes, then I think, well, how is a little indeterminism going to screw all that up? You know, it's just one more thing, and it seems like a less important problem than the other two. Okay, so that's the way it gets started. Um, and then, once we have a little bit of moral responsibility in the picture, especially if we think that moral responsibility requires free will, that a being doesn't have moral responsibility unless it has some free will, uh, then we can get the old Aristotelian character shaping thing up and running, and we get to uh, free and morally responsible adult agents. That's pretty quick, but... Um, okay, and as I say on the handout, this isn't going to do for everybody. Uh, but I try to fight one battle at a time, and that's the end. <laughs>